DNA uh, is a foundation to help uh, uh, network operators. They started by helping them organize meetups, but since the war in Ukraine, they also provide uh, donated equipment to keep the internet running uh, in the country. Um, so, uh, Sonda uh, Stefan is going to talk us through. Take it away, Sonda. Thank you. Microphone seems to be working. So, um, yeah, welcome. Um, so Keep Ukraine Connected uh, is a task force of... Why does this always work except when you're... Eh, I'm too far away, apparently. <laughs> so it's a, t a task force of the Global Knock Alliance. Um, we just started uh, doing stuff for the network uh, community. Um, NOGs are operator groups. They uh, get, uh, usually get together, uh, exchange knowledge, uh, help each other out, uh, things like that. And we were just supporting them, hosting their websites, uh, hosting their email, just making their life a bit easier. Um, but then the war in Ukraine happened. So we are all like very close together. The, the network operator community is quite a close community. So our uh, board member, our chair, actually wrote, uh, drove a truck to Ukraine um, to help them out with uh, humanitarian good. And then he was like, well, if we can do this for, with humanitarian goods, why don't we help the network people over there? So this is the picture of, uh, of how it started. Just two trucks full of uh, relief goods in, uh, in March. Um, but yeah, this was not enough. So, um, how uh, does this actually uh, uh, work? Bringing uh, uh, goods to, uh, uh, to Ukraine um, with a truck, the biggest problem is actually the border crossing. Um, you, st uh, you stand there uh, for hours in a queue. So after the first trip, we had a board meeting, um, and we decided we start a task force, keep Ukraine connected. Now, you know, what do you do? Um, my girlfriend is a designer, so she designed the logo. We registered a, a website. We're like, oh, let's just ask some people for help. So what, what do we do? Well, we, uh, we need to help the, the people in Ukraine. And um, we have contacts in the whole community, so I'm sure we can get something together. And this was just a very, you know, just in, a, in one weekend, what can we do? Um, but this got bigger and bigger really, uh, uh, really fast. So um, we made a little uh, application, web-based, where uh, people from Ukraine could register what they need. Uh, we would register all the donations uh, uh, there. Um, and actually, since then, we, we made multiple uh, deliveries. So, my friend said, like, oh, you start, you start as a network engineer, and three weeks later, it turns out you're a supply chain manager. Um, yeah, so we, uh, uh, we have the dip base. We're figuring out what everybody needs, what everybody uh, is, is donating. And this is a lot. So we started out with a little, uh, you know, just a, a little idea. Um, but then we, uh, our phone didn't stop ringing. People kept donating stuff. We got from a big U.S. It donated um, pallets and pallets of equipment. Uh, we got donations from all around uh, uh, Europe. Uh, it's been completely crazy. So yeah, we have our, our little database um, because we don't want to just drive some junk to Ukraine. It's like, here is some 100 megabit uh, uh, Ethernet hubs. Have fun. Bye. You know, we actually want to do something that, that helps them. So people can put, uh, from Ukraine can actually put in, these are the things we need. So a, a donor can, uh, uh, can, uh, can see what's in the system. Um, the requester can see what's in the system. And we actually work together with uh, the uh, ministry in Ukraine 
and uh, we have a lot of help from a company called Debs. Debs is actually uh, a distributor. Like they, uh, it's usually their business to to sell hardware. But in the war, they uh, they actually work together with the Internet Association, and they uh, uh, are now doing all of this work for free. We ship all the donated equipment to them. They will actually clean it up, repackage it, check it, ship it out to all the parties in, the, in Ukraine. And we now have people uh, like in actual war zones using this equipment. So why are we doing this? Well, Ukraine is... Some people are like, oh, Ukraine sounds like a third world country. We don't know much about it. Um, but no, like the, the vast majority of people had internet access. Um, they, uh, 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 they have a lot of uh, uh, people on, uh, online. I, uh, I read the other day that like the average bandwidth a person has is 60 megabits. Uh, they have a very large fiber to the home deployments. Um, so yeah, so when the war started, internet became even more important to them. So you can see how uh, uh, how how the, how the trends uh, uh, go. Like the, the line go, go, shows where the, where the invasion started, and suddenly um, uh, non-Ukrainian, non-Russian apps are being downloaded a lot. And this is what they uh, uh, the, the working conditions they have in. Like I, I tell people, like if if I ever complain about my working conditions again, let me take a look at this picture because. On the left here, that's an exploded tank. And the guy sit sitting there is uh, uh, welding some fibers, uh, uh, using a fiber splicer to, to fix some, uh, some backbone links. This is, this is crazy. Um, yeah, it turns out that fiber connections and tanks and bombs are not really compatible. So this is what they, uh, uh, what they do a lot now. They, uh, uh, they, they, they actually have to find the, fi the broken fibers, um, use tools to measure fiber is broken, um, and then fix it. But yeah, it's lo lots of times bridges are used for uh, fiber across because uh, a bridge is obviously like if you're especially if you're crossing water, it's a very convenient way to get your fiber across. But yeah, everything is completely destroyed. Yeah, and then you're standing there and you actually need military staff protecting you because these pictures are actually taken in uh, uh, Kharkiv and uh, Donetsk and this is actually still a war zone. They're trying to fix the internet while the war is still going on in that region. So it's actually quite dangerous work as well. Yeah, this is... Uh, Oh, this is a, a, bit, a bit of a, uh, of a server rack or a data center. Cell towers being destroyed. So yeah, so this was the, these are pictures from the, the first run to, uh, uh, to Ukraine. Um, we loaded up stuff uh, and uh, Rene, the guy in the left picture, he uh, drove a truck from Berlin via Prague to Ljubljana, which is like all the way south uh, uh, in Europe and then uh, stayed there for a day, then drove back to Poland, uh, and then crossed uh, into Ukraine to actually deliver all the stuff. We have pallets of, uh, of servers, fiber splicers, switches. Um, and yeah, well, like I said, the most difficult bit is actually the custom queue. If you're driving a truck, that means that you stand in that queue. Like I think he arrived in the queue at 11 in the morning and finally uh, made it to the front of the queue at 7 in the evening. You know, just standing there for eight hours, just queuing. But then, eight hours later, um, the white truck was uh, uh, from our side, from, uh, from Debs. So they just put them back to back and loaded everything up. And this was our first delivery. But then, what next? Oh, well, we're working on the whole supply chain. Um, we wrote uh, uh, the tools. We're still looking uh, for people to help out with all of this um, because, yeah, it, it's still a lot of work. So what are we currently working on? Well, 
we uh, are still looking for, for more donors, um, especially uh, the high-end ISP network gear. Um, but we're also looking for, uh, for partners to, uh, to work with us, especially in the, uh, in, in the logistics. Um, governments are very hard to work with because they work on a completely different uh, level. They talk to people uh, 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 from the massive, uh, the big ISPs, you know, the, uh, the national telcos, um, the ones that, uh, uh, that are like multi, multi-million uh, dollar companies. Um, except Ukraine has a lot of smaller ISPs. Um, I don't know uh, if, you're, uh, like when I started working on the internet in 95, um, every town had its own ISP. Like th there was lots of diversity, lots of uh, smaller companies working together. Um, and everything got bought up and centralized and now every country has just a handful of ISP left. But Ukraine is still at the, at the point where they have small ISPs that just have 10,000 users or 50,000 users. Um, and that actually made them really, really resilient. Um, but the downside is, is that um, nobody has a good view of who needs help. So as you, uh, as you saw in the, uh, in the pictures, um, they have a lot of broken fiber. So one of the things we're doing is we're uh, using all the donated money to buy uh, splicing equipment, to fix those fibers, to, uh, uh, to measure where the errors are, stuff like that. Um, except this is not cheap equipment. Um, if you have a professional fiber splicer, yeah, I, I uh, say it's about nine, ten thousand uh, euros per splicer. Um, we, I think, we still have like a request for forty of them outstanding. So um, we're still looking for uh, lots, of, uh, lots of donations there. Um, of course, my screen goes to sleep. I'm sorry. Um, so yes, we're collecting money, we're collecting equipment, and we actually have multiple uh, trips uh, going to, uh, uh, to Ukraine. We have volunteers in Poland, volunteers in Germany, um, who just spend their own time, they're not getting paid, driving around in their van, collecting equipment, bringing it to Ukraine. So it's, it's a really impressive uh, uh, effort. And of course, all this, all this volunteering work um, is, uh, is, uh, is not something we get paid for. This is something we do in our spare time. So we have our day jobs, we have our families, um, and this is, yeah, basically just a hobby. <laughs> so, and, and as, as usual, hobbies are very expensive. So, yeah, who's, who's, who, who's behind the, uh, all, uh, all this? Well, um, there's Corin Pritchard, is actually sitting right over there. Um, she uh, does a lot of communication and design for us. Natalie Treneman um, works at uh, Ripe NCC. She's, uh, uh, she's helping a lot. Basically, when she, when she started helping out, she said, I will help you, but I'll kick your butt. Because you are way too disorganized and you need somebody uh, to tell you what to do. And we were like, yes, please. Please tell us what to do. We have no idea what we're doing. So she's, she's the one who's, uh, uh, who's helping us structure everything. Um, well, there's, uh, uh, there's me, uh, Jan George, a uh, uh, good friend of mine from Sl uh, Slovenia. Then we have uh, 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 René Fichtmüller. Um, uh, he works for Flex Optics, and he, uh, he's the one who drove the first truck to, to Ukraine. Eric Beis is helping us a lot, um, and actually he sponsored, uh, uh, him and his business uh, partners sponsored two tents here at uh, uh, MCH. And they're actually uh, right next to the music stage, where we are uh, collecting uh, uh, hardware for Ukraine or collecting donations, and then uh, uh, the proceeds from that go to Ukraine. So he's helping us a lot, especially at this event. And then the next one, Daniel and uh, Martin, those are two volunteers who are driving all the vans back and forth with all, with all the equipment. So we also have a lot of help from uh, Ukraine, like, because like I said, we don't just want to be one of those charities who just collect junk and dump it over the border. Um, we actually want to know what they need before we send stuff. 
So we have people uh, from the uh, associations uh, uh, of internet providers, we have people from the association of um, di uh, what is it? digital rights, copyright, stuff like that. Um, we have people at DEPS, the distributor, um, and maybe good to point out that distributor wasn't chosen by us, they were chosen by the Ukrainian uh, internet providers. So we're trying to do it uh, as, uh, their way as much as we can. We're not telling them what we're going to do, we actually ask them what they want us to do. So this way we, uh, we, we talk to people at the different associations, distributors, um, and make sure that people in Ukraine actually get what they uh, need. A oh, whole load of sponsors. Nope, and there I'm going too fast. And this is uh, actually um, uh, something we're, uh, we're working on uh, uh, at the moment, is to get those uh, splicers. Like I said, they are insanely expensive. Um, we actually got a very good deal. We usually uh, uh, get them about half the usual price. So we're actually talking to the distributors, to the manufacturers, um, and we get them uh, for uh, about 5,000 for a really professional splicer. So this, day, this slide is a bit outdated. We got, a, uh, we got some more splicers now, especially because last week we got a massive donation. So we, we just put in some, some more uh, uh, orders um, but yeah, the, uh, if, you, if, if you look at the right, the, um, the, uh, the splicers that are really good for like long distance trunks, uh, we need about 20 of those. And for the, the fiber to the home, because there's a lot of smaller ISPs, we're actually looking uh, uh, at about needing 40 of those. So even though we're getting quite some donations, we're not there by, by a long shot. Um, what else are we uh, uh, doing? Well, like I said, we're getting donations from uh, big companies. Um, for the network engineers in the room, we're actually getting uh, Juniper MX 2010s and MX 960s donated. So, um, yeah, this is not cheap hardware that's a couple of decades old. This is actually quite, quite decent hardware for lots of 10 gig and 100 gig uh, links. Um, so, yeah, so not all of that is necessary right now. So one of the things when I said we were looking for partners to work with is actually finding warehouses where we can store stuff. Um, most of the people who donate equipment say, oh, if you can't use it, then sell it and use the money to buy something you can use. Um, except that, oh, that's cute. <laughs> Always happens when you're presenting, right? Um, so yeah, so um, the problem is the moment we ship it uh, into Ukraine, um, we can't get it back anymore. We can't go like, oh, we shipped it to Ukraine, but they can't actually use it. So at that point, we can't ship it back into Europe and then try to sell it and buy something else for them. So one of the problems we're having at the moment is where do we store uh, the hardware that's donated, but not necessary or not yet necessary, um, so we can sell it and, and get, some, get something else. Um, those are actually quite hard problems, because um, the logistics companies around the world are in a really bad shape at the moment. Um, we actually tr uh, saw that this week when we were trying to get the banners for the, uh, uh, for the tents next to the music stage. Um, they got delivered to the wrong address, they, uh, 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 they were actually late, and um, we did a, 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 like an expedited order for the stickers we got uh, uh, about uh, Keep Ukraine Connected, and we got a notification that they would be delivered on Monday. So we actually drove to the UPS depot in Hofdorp earlier today to get the stickers out of the supply chain because UPS couldn't actually deliver them on time. <laughs> So, yeah, we have stickers at the tent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, can, you can see how, how, how much trouble all the logistics companies are having. So, um, being able to actually uh, store some, some large equipment for a longer time. Um, for, uh, for example, those, if you're talking about those big routers, um, a lot of data centers got destroyed. We, like we, uh, 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 we regularly get videos from one of the ISPs where the data center is just burning. Um, 
that's not something they're going to fix in the short term. In the short term, they're just going to need some, uh, 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 some emergency backup, some connections. Um, but maybe half a year from now or a year from now, when the war calms down and hopefully Ukraine is in a better shape, then they'll need some, uh, some of that equipment. So that's some of the logistic problems we're, uh, uh, we're still working on. Um, and like I said, the other one is uh, uh, political customs. When I said you're, uh, you're standing for eight hours in that queue to even get to the front of the queue to, uh, uh, to talk to customs, um, if you're in uh, uh, and we're leaving through Poland, you need a stack of paper just to document what you're exporting, that you have export permission, because Network Gear has encryption software, so it's dual-use goods, so you have to have export licenses and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, of course, you need all this paperwork, and then uh, you have to export it, declare that you're providing this as humanitarian aid, and then you're uh, uh, at the border talking to a customs guy who is like, this isn't humanitarian aid, this is equipment, network equipment. Like, yes, internet is important for people, so like, we, they need this because it got destroyed. Um, and our first shipment almost got sent back, we actually were looking for warehouses to store the stuff, because uh, uh, one guy at the customs uh, 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 was n uh, not sure that he would allow this through uh, out of Poland. Luckily, everything worked, but it's sometimes quite hard to convince people that this is also important from a humanitarian point of view. On the Ukrainian side, uh, things are a lot easier. You send the paperwork in advance, they give you a QR code, you go to the customs, scan the QR code, and you're basically good to go. So it's actually really impressive what the Ukrainians have, uh, uh, have, have done there. Um, so yeah, so... Um, oh, I, f I forgot to tell you about that, that bit. Um, what we also are shipping a lot is uh, power over Ethernet switches and Wi-Fi access points. Um, to help people in the bomb shelters, because people have to shelter from all the, uh, all the violence, um, and the internet is the only way they can keep con uh, connected. Cell towers are being destroyed, mobile networks are being taken over, so um, for people to have free internet access so they can actually FaceTime their family and tell everybody they're okay is, is really important. So that's also one of the uh, things we're, uh, we're working on. And it just shows how, from a, like I said, from a humanitarian perspective, how important it is to, to, help, to help people get proper internet access. I'm actually talking way too fast, because that was my last slide. Um, <laughs> so I guess we have some more time for questions. Okay, so first question is, do you prioritize in, uh, uh, infrastructure to mobile towers? Um, actually, no. Um, what we uh, see a lot is that the mobile towers and the cell companies are getting a lot of help through the government. Um, there, is, uh, there are international warehouses shipping stuff to the Ukrainian government who then distributes it. And you often hear people say like, oh, but you know, the internet in Ukraine is fine. But yeah, then you're talking about the multi-million dollar companies. Um, but because there are so many smaller companies, um, that is uh, where the, the major pain is. So what we uh, do is we send it to Debs in uh, Ukraine. Um, they actually uh, keep a list of who is providing service. Like, like I said, there's a lot of fiber to the home. So um, they say, okay, you know, we're, uh, we're now first making every ISP at least... Uh, uh, one fiber splicer to fix the, the connections to people's homes. Um, so we're more focusing on that than on the really large companies in the cell towers. Can I, can I ask a question? Is it the, <laughs> oh, repeat, yeah, does it, does it answer your question? Um, I think it's super impressive what you guys are doing. Um, really, really nice. Um, and what I really like is the tool you built to combine questions and available supply. And I was wondering um, if you would be willing to open source it 
It already is. It already is. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... I'm so happy because, like I said, this started just as a small project. Like, oh, let's see if we can get some stuff for Ukraine. Yeah. And I'm really happy that I wrote that tool in the first couple of weeks because after that, I wouldn't have had the energy to do it anymore. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> but no, it's on, the, uh, it's on GitHub uh, slash Nog Alliance and uh, the, the tool is over there. Perfect. We're going to use it for supplies to the front in Kharkiv. And uh, if you need any assistance with the logistics, we've managed to solve many of the headaches you have. Um, so let's drink a beer afterwards. That sounds like an excellent plan. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the, uh, from the internet? Yeah. Can I? No questions at the moment. Yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, did the low orbit uh, satellite stuff from Musk uh, help? Uh, ah. That's, yeah. a, a, that, that's a very good question. Um, so what we understood is that most of, the, uh, of those connections uh, first went to the, uh, the government and military and uh, those offices. Um, one of the things, uh, and, I, and I spoke to, um, uh, what's, what's her name, like a um, reporter, South Frontiers uh, style organization, and they were actually very uh, careful uh, uh, with this. Because Russians have uh, uh, missiles that, that home in on satellite signals. So one of the things uh, they said is if you use those uh, Starlink uh, dishes, put them far away from you. Um, put them there, walk away, then turn them on, use them for a short time, and then turn them off, wait a few minutes, then go pick them up. <laughs> I un understood that they have very long uh, Ethernet cables to... to <laughs> yeah, they, they better have. Yeah, I, uh, I heard from the, the reporters that they uh, said that it actually happened that um, reporters had uh, satellite phones and were um, doing like live broadcasts from Ukraine and speaking on that phone for half an hour. That's a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> Don't do that. Next question is, is there any way we can talk to the Polish government about the, uh, the, the, the uh, border control of your stuff? Yeah, can we put any pressure from here to there? We are, we, uh, we are talking to people from the, from the EU. Uh, we have some connections in Poland. Okay. It's also difficult uh, because you can talk to the officials, but the guy standing at the border doesn't know anything. So getting that right is, is, is a bit tricky, but uh, we're definitely working on getting better paperwork to convince them. And the last question is, uh, using the military supplies for, for guns and blah, 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 to, to shift your stuff also there. We haven't looked at... Is it at, possible? Uh, I, I don't know. We, uh, uh, we try to uh, focus on the more humanitarian side of, of what's needed than on the military side, so we haven't spoken to the military a lot. In the beginning, we, uh, uh, we asked, like, oh, we want to help network engineers. What do you need? And we got a list of, like, bulletproof vests, and, yeah. <laughs> and that, that's not our thing. No, what I mean is... But using them for transport... Use their logistics. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Another, another question for him? Hello? Yeah. So I have a question. I just reminded, like it a bit picks up on one the, on the things that the person in front of me said. Um, you said that you have problems with warehouses. Uh, did you also try with the military? Because, for example, at least I know that in Slovenia, military d does have a lot of warehouses. Hmm. They also um, make it available to certain organizations, mostly, um, I personally know it's for scouts. I don't know if the military wants to meddle in these things in, a, in an official way, but uh, have you tried that? And uh, yeah. We haven't, we should. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, so my question would be like, what do the Russians do after they occupy an area? Do they try to disrupt the networks? Do they try to censor? Do they try to route its, uh, the traffic uh, in another way? So the, uh, usually when the Russians occupy a territory, the, uh, the mobile signals and internet connections go, uh, are fed back to Russia. So people in those areas get Russian TV, they get Russian cell service, they get Russian filtered internet. Um, what well, we saw uh, the region uh, around uh, Kiev, where the, the Russians actually went away, um, is that 
they destroy everything in, uh, uh, that they leave behind. So they, uh, in, in data centers, they just pull stuff out of the racks and smash it on the floor. Um, in the offices, they, uh, and this was before Bitcoin went down so far, but um, yeah, they uh, basically opened all the office PCs and uh, pulled out all the video cards and SSDs before leaving. So um, yeah, there's a, uh, they basically, uh, uh, be, uh, when, when they are somewhere and they stay, they make sure it's all Russian controlled. The moment they are driven away again or they uh, pull back, they, des they destroy everything before they leave. So that's, that's what we can see from the strategy. Thanks for the question. And just another check, any more uh, questions from the internet? Uh, is that, I can't hear, is that <laughs> thumbs down or thumbs up? These lights are very bright. <laughs> They're very bright. No, okay. Well, I, so, I have a question actually. So you, you yes, have a, a um, tent. For, for, first, I'm sorry because I said, oh, uh, we'll take maximum 10 minutes of questions and then I was finished too early. So sorry for messing up <laughs> no, your schedule. No, no, that's fine. It's fine. It, it was an um, awesome talk, so thank you. Um, but you, uh, one question I have. You have a, a tent here, don't you? Yes. yes so, so tell, tell us about the tent. So yeah, there's uh, the, uh, the bring and donate tent next to the, the music stage. Um, you can bring stuff there like books and stuff to, that other people then can, uh, can use here at, the, uh, at MCH um, and then donate money for, for Ukraine. Um, if you have any uh, uh, equipment that's actually usable for people in Ukraine, uh, we're collecting that as well, although I doubt you're walking around with a massive router, but hey, who, who knows, it's MCH. It's MCH yeah. Um, but yeah, so um, we will be in the, uh, in the tent, there will be uh, people to talk to, we actually uh, are putting, some, uh, putting up some of the pictures uh, to, to show what's happening in, the, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and even if you can't do anything now, uh, please come by. We have, uh, uh, we have stickers, uh, we have postcards and uh, stuff like that. So uh, even if we can't do anything right now, um, maybe you can help out when you get home. Brilliant. Thanks for it. Let's, let's thank our, our speaker uh, for an amazing talk. Thank you. <laughs>